Greetings, this is Doc Ock, live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Studio here in Kent, Ohio, on another beautiful day in paradise. What else could we call it but another beautiful day in paradise? As many of you may already have heard, Maybe you got the word and maybe you didn't. We've been celebrating Juneteenth for this entire month. As well as last year, we did the same. And surprise, surprise, to our chagrin, the U.S. House of Representatives just a few hours ago has just voted to make Juneteenth the 12th national federally recognized holiday in the United States of America. Now that's a bit of a bizarre twist on things because at the same time that we're being thrown this bone, our voting rights are being diminished because every state in the union is working diligently at making sure that black folks can't vote. So we will never get to decide on what direction the country goes in. Somebody else will always be doing the deciding for us. So um, something to think about and ponder. You may even want to check out the uh, video I posted uh, early this morning, 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. I think this morning. I posted a video of Karen Hunter and um, Greg, Dr. Greg Carr on a weekly podcast talk or a weekly vlog talking about how, uh, talking about Juneteenth and whether or not it, they thought it should be recognized as a federal holiday or whether it was best to leave it the way that it all were, already was where it was a day that African Americans celebrated. And if somebody else wanted to join in, they were welcome to join in, but it wasn't anything that was being, you know, had become commercialized, first and foremost. Something that had not become commercialized. It was a holiday we've been recognizing and celebrating for at least 156 years. And in some areas of the country, even longer than that, although it wasn't officially called Juneteenth in those areas. It was called something else. But um, Emancipation Day, Juneteenth, same thing. So um, tonight we're going to continue our um, reading of the stories of a, two African-American women we've been reading in the afternoon. We read about, uh, we've been reading about Sojourner Truth, and in the evenings, we've been reading about Mary Stagecoach Fields. So we're going to continue to tell her story tonight, but before we get started, you know there's a couple things you need to do, and you may have already done it. Number one, give us a like if you're watching on Facebook. Number two, give us a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. And last but not least, make sure to spread the word far and wide, up and down all through the land about what we've been doing right here at Black Facts, steady on the case for the race every single day, whether Juneteenth was a federally recognized holiday or not, we have been recognizing it uh, throughout the community. So let's go ahead and do our proverb of the day, and then we're going to get on uh, with the getting on, and I'm going to relate a um, some recollections about Mary Fields from a unexpected corner of the universe. Okay, an un unexpected uh, famous personage that all of you have heard of or have seen on TV or in the movies, but never realized that he was watching us while we were watching him. Think about that. Um, 
Let's see. Ah, here we go. Proverb for today is, if you climb up a tree, you must climb down the same tree. Now, that's what I call mother wit. See, that's a mother wit type stuff right there, man. Because my mama, she's always coming with some simple stuff like that. That when you hear it, you got no doubt. There's no doubt in your mind. You don't need a barometer. You don't need a thermometer. You don't need any type of scientific instruments to know the truth when you hear it. It rings clear as a bell. If you climb up a tree, you got to climb down the very same tree. Unless you're going to fly out of the tree like a flying squirrel, Rocky or something. I don't know. Meanwhile, uh, that is a proverb from the country of Sierra Leone, otherwise known as, in English as Mountain Lion. That's right. That's from the country of the Mountain Lions. So today, we're going to be um, continue, like I said, with the story of Mary Stagecoach Fields. But this time, we're going to be um, relating the story from the perspective of someone who you may not have expected even knew who she was. And he actually is, was, has been a movie star by the name of Gary Cooper. And I'm going to show you a picture of him. So if you've seen him in the movies, you'll know who I'm talking, who we're talking about. Okay, there you see Mary Fields with her 1876 vintage Winchester carbine. And here, oops, okay, in a minute, we'll get it. Go ahead and spin it in a minute. There you go. And here is the person that we've been talking about, the late, great Gary Cooper, star of stage and screen from Helena, Montana, formerly a cowboy himself. So he actually knew Mary Stagecoach Fields. And he's somebody that was on the, the stage, on the screen during my lifetime. So not that long ago. Now, if I can just read this copy. Oh, I got the wrong copy. That's right. I, I knew I made two copies for a reason. Ah, there we go. That's the copy that I'm talking about. Now we're good. All right. By, uh, now, this uh, article that I'm reading actually appeared in Ebony Magazine, October 1977. So if you want to look it up, you can look it up and you can read along or you can, uh, because you can uh, find it on your computer or you can read it later if you like. So the article is called Stagecoach by Gary Cooper as told to Mark Crawford. And here we go. A gun-toting black woman delivered the U.S. mail in Cascade, Montana. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I got part of this on here. Yeah, the U.S. mail in Montana. They say, quote unquote, Black Mary could whip any two men in the territory. Now, you know, back in the day, they probably wouldn't have called her Black Mary. Their name, they probably gave her a little bit different description. And you know what that is, so I don't even have to say it. She wore a 38 Smith & Wesson strapped under her apron. And they swear she couldn't miss a thing within 50 paces. She was long, tall, and heavy. Weighing well over 200 pounds. And except for an apron and a skirt, she wore men's clothes. Black Mary was what they called her, but her real name was Mary Fields, one of the most picturesque characters in the history of Montana. She was a stagecoach driver, the second female ever to drive a U.S. star, a star U.S. mail route. Now, a star route, that means that she was driving for under contract, okay? They didn't hire her directly, but she did this as a, on a contract basis which made Mary her own boss, just like FedEx. Um, 
Maybe because she was a Negro, she was never bothered by Indians. I remember seeing her in Cascade when I was just a little shaver of nine or so. She smoked cigars until the day she died in 1914. She must have been about 81, as near as anyone could figure. She celebrated two birthdays a year because she didn't know the exact date of her birth. And they would close Cascade schools in her honor whenever she felt like having a birthday. They say Mary had a fondness for hard liquor that was matched only by her capacity to put it away. And it's historical fact that one of Cascade's early mayors, D.W. Monroe, gave special permission in writing to Mary to let her drink in the saloons with the men, which, quote unquote, was a privilege back in the day, if you want to call it that. Born a slave somewhere in the great state of Tennessee, some say around the year 1832, Mary lived to become one of the freest souls ever to draw breath or a 38, and she was celebrated in a pen and ink drawing that hangs in the Cascade Bank, even now. It was done by the late Charlie Russell, a cowboy artist and the greatest one to come out of the West. Mary lived in Mississippi for a time and was a passenger on board the Robert E. Lee when it participated in the race on the Mississippi with Steamboat Bill's Natchez as famed in story and song, and she took great pride in telling how the hams and sides of bacon were fed into the firebox to keep the boiler hot. In June of 30th of 1870, Mary moved, later moved to Ohio, where she worked at the Ursuline Convent in Toledo, Ohio. Here, she met Mother Amadeus, a Catholic nun, who she revered and loved, though one account has it that Mary was a slave and confidential servant in the household of Judge Dunn, the nun's oldest brother. Others say Mary had been the nun's personal maid before her mistress took the vows. In any case, it was because of Ma Mother Amadeus that Mary went to Montana in the first place. The nun went to open a school for Indian girls in 1884 at St. Peter's Mission, where Jesuit priests worked hard amongst the Blackfeet since 1866. Because of the hard living and intense cold, I've seen it get 45 degrees below zero myself. Mother Amadeus took pneumonia and lay dying in a crude log cabin. Mary Fields heard the story back in Ohio and lost no time getting to the bedside of her friend. She nursed the nun back to health and remained in Montana to help the missionaries with the hard labor. Hmm. Ooh, wow, a lot of pictures in here. Okay, had a few pictures. There we go. An army chaplain, chaplain named Father Lind Smith stationed at Fort uh, Cough visited the mission in 1887 and wrote of this amusing incident. A skunk invaded the chicken house, killed 62 of Mary's choice baby chicks and pile them up in a heap. With the spirit of indignation and satisfaction, she carried the animal to the sisters and told them of the tragedy. Father Lynn Smith inquired, Mary, didn't you receive the odor of his wrath when you killed him? Ah, uh, no, Father, she replied. I killed him 
from the rear. Yeah, he never he never saw it coming, Father. Never knew what hit him. After eight years, the Ursuline nuns stone convent was completed and Mary and the sisters moved from the log cabins which had been their home. Bishop Brondell came for the exodus, supervised and helped with the work, but none dared move anything at all belonging to Mother Amadeus. That was a job Mary had cut out for herself. Mary also did the freighting for the mission and often spent the prairie nights fighting her way through storms and braving great dangers. One night, a pack of wolves frightened her team. The horses upset the load, and she stayed guard all night over the precious cargo the nuns needed to exist. A blizzard overtook her on one trip. The road was lost from sight. Mary walked back and forth, back and forth, New York, L.A., back and forth, all through the night to keep from freezing to death. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and break it off right about there because that's as good a place as any to stop. And we'll, uh, com we'll come back to this story tomorrow. We should be able to finish it by tomorrow. Okay, so, so you see here we've got a few different personal testimonials about Mary Stagecoach Fields. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's always good to hear from someone who knew somebody or even better still to hear from the very person themselves. We like to get our stories from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But at this time, we're going to end our storytelling for tonight. You know who this is. This is Doc Ock signing off. But before we go, you know there's one more thing I got to say before I end this show. All you little children need to put your little heads on your little, under your little pillows, on your little pillows, on your little bed, and close those yeah, yeah eyes while you wait for that sun to rise. And when you feel those sunbeams beaming down on your eyes, you know that it's time for you to rise and shine. Oh, chilling of mine. As for you adults, what we need you to do is to go ahead and continue to show your support for tubular black facts and Doc Ock at noon and nine by making a donation in more than a one way. Number one, give us a like. That's a freebie if you're watching on Facebook. Give us a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. That one also is free. Or you can actually become a sustaining member of the Black Facts family. All you need to do is to go ahead and send us a donation. You can do that by going to our website, B-L-A-K-F-A-C-T-S dot O-R-G. If I said that too fast, go ahead and look right below on our um, in our description of our live stream on YouTube. You'll see the link there. Link up. Hit that donation button in the top right corner, and you're good. If you want to use, go if you want to get to us through Facebook, and you're on your mobile phone, go to your notification list. You'll see a notification there that we invited you to make a donation. And last but not least, if you're on your uh, laptops, desktops, or other devices, then just look right below any one of our live streams, and you should see a link down there that will take you to the very same place where you can make that recurring donation. Five, 10, 15, 20 a month would be a welcome addition to help us continue to do the work that we're doing here. If you think it's important, show your love in a way that's real. In the meanwhile, peace out without a doubt with justice because anything less disgust us. We like being discussed, 
but we don't like feeling disgusted. 